The past week has been quite a bit interesting for League. With changes to champions, summoner spells, and runes, a lot has changed in almost every single position. And wait, do you see what I see? It looks like the like and sub buttons are asking you to click them, and I mean honestly, it makes sense. It's the best way to keep up with all of our videos and guides to make sure you have the best information available. But now it's time to jump right in. As always, we'll start off with our mid lane tier list, and the only champion in the broken tier here is every firefighter's worst nightmare, a kid who plays with fire. Annie hits all the high points. She's not super complex, but she has a lot of things that you can improve on and learn and get better as you play the champion. She does a ton of damage. She's pretty hard to kill. She's pretty flexible. Most important of all is that she doesn't really have a huge counter. She's good at taking short fights. She's good with long fights. She has the ability to deal with people who dive on top of her. She has the ability to deal with people who kite her. And while she's definitely better at some things compared to others, if you're playing her well and manage to actually do everything correctly, you could deal with just about anything. And that's why she's broken tier. There is a champion who gets pretty close to countering Annie though, and that's Galio, and he's gonna be our S tier highlight. When played properly, Galio can deal with pretty much any of the other S tier mid laners as well as everybody below. He's also extremely good at escaping ganks and very, very good at setting up ganks. And if that wasn't enough, he also has his ultimate, which can reach to top lane and to bot lane if he moves out of his mid lane just a little bit in order to ulti and roam and get some nice plays in. Or he could even ulti the jungler as he invades or while he's getting invaded to show up and absolutely smash the competition. The downside to Galio is that he is weak to certain CCs, particularly knockups and knockbacks. And there are champions who can burn through him without fear of dying, like Cassiopeia if she plays it correctly. But let's take a step down now and start moving towards the middle of the pack and talk about our A tier. The broken tier in the S tier really barely saw any movement, but there were a few champions who moved downwards. And we're going to highlight one of them, Ari, right now. Ari is a champion who has a decent early game and has the ability to solo kill many champions in the game. She spikes hard at level 6 where she unlocks all of her mobility and some of her guaranteed damage. But as you might have already guessed, that's the problem. Ari needs to hit level 6 and while she can solo kill people in the early game, it's all skill shots. This makes her harder to pull off than most other champions and if she misses the most important one, her charm, she likely loses any fight that she's going to take. In lanes where Ari is already on the back foot, it can be easier to use her charm there because she's mostly going to be reacting to people diving on top of her, but even still, it means that she's not having a great time. Still though, she's better than most of the rest, so she's not an awful pick by any sense of the imagination. And I mean, let's be real, a lot of people play Ari because they have a uh, hyperactive imagination, let's put it that way. We're just going to drop that one and move on and talk about our B tier highlight. Let's talk about Zerith. An immobile, really high range artillery cannon is basically what Zerith is, and this makes him pretty strong. He has the ability to deal with many of the other powerful short range champions in the game, but the problem is that he only has one ability to do so. If you happen to miss your E skill shot on Zerith past the laning phase, you're going to be in some deep trouble. That stun is the one thing that allows you to save yourself or save other people from certain champions who like to dive in and when it misses, you're probably dead. Sure, his W has a slow, but slows usually aren't enough to stop people like Jarvan, Kane, Scion, or whoever else from diving on top of yourself and absolutely wrecking your face. If you do happen to get fed or ahead on Zerith though, it can seem really, really strong, and I mean, it is. Zerith has incredible AP ratios and can dish out a ton of damage, but it is still all skill shots, so it's not even redeeming enough to really pull him out of the B tier. Now for C tier, let's talk about Irelia, as she's a very interesting champion. You see, Irelia is very hard to play, but once you learn how to get past her initial difficulty and actually learn her kit, understand it, start hitting your skill shots and all that stuff, she's actually really strong. And honestly, the champion sort of plays itself in that sense, where a lot of her abilities are extremely obvious to use, but there's no really good way to avoid that. When you're facing really good Irelia players, you're going to notice that you kind of know what they're doing and you expect every play that they make, but it's just so strong that it doesn't even matter. Or maybe you just don't have the tools to be able to deal with it. The deck is definitely stacked in Irelia's favor when it comes to fighting against people who have skill shot CC. But at that point, it's back on the Irelia player to make the good play and actually dodge out on stuff, and then she can win the fight really easily. You might be able to see the pattern here that we're going through where it's constantly coming back to, oh, the Irelia has to do something in response. The Irelia has to learn how to make the play. The Irelia is the one who has to learn how to avoid the CC. The Irelia is the one who has to set herself up, etc., etc., until the moon dies. And I'm no expert when it comes to the moon or any planet for that matter, but I have a feeling that it's gonna be a long time. And when you finally manage to jump over the moon that is Irelia's difficulty initially, you're probably going to find yourself stomping until you meet yourself in a new elo and start needing to improve again. 
And now as we move on to the D tier, I'm going to start a little something new here. We're going to keep a cumulative counter of how many patches go by before we move Akali out of D tier. And I think it's been something like 7, 8, maybe even 9 patches, probably more since she's gone in there in the first place. And let's just keep track together of how long it takes for her to get the heck out of there. Mid lane's nice and wrapped up though, so let's move on to the top lane now. And honestly, before I even continue, I'll just say I'm going to keep the same rule here for D tier as every single time we're going to highlight Akali because she's still trash. But let's take it back to the top of the list for top lane. Broken tier, Singed and Urgot are still the top two. Singed is actually doing better than he was in the past and this is likely because of the ghost changes which can really turn Singed into somebody who's basically impossible to kill. I mean, if he gets an assist here, a kill there, all of a sudden he's got almost 20 seconds of ghost going, and then he's already a halfway across the map before you can even try and auto attack him. Urgot isn't one to be getting left behind though, as he's still pretty much neck and neck with Singed here. Urgot hasn't really had much changed, but he's been strong, so it makes sense that he would continue to be strong. And with the amount of value that his ultimate brings, and just how strong he can get into the late game, even if he did end up getting some kind of changes, he would still be a good champion, probably in A tier, because that ultimate is just so good. But enough about those two meme lords, let's talk about S tier, and here we're gonna highlight Maokai, as the tree man has seemingly snuck his way back up into higher tiers. And honestly, when you look at the rest of S tier, and some of the champions in A tier, it does make sense. Maokai is very good against champions who rely on having repeated ability hits in order to charge his passive and get a ton of healing. You could probably see how Singed, Malphite, and Wukong would all be really good in that regard for Maokai. At the same time, having a slow on his Q, a root on his R, a root on his W, and a slow on his E, he can kite all the other champions who rely on mobility to kill people while still being fairly healthy against them. And of course, Maokai does scale into a team fighting monster who can be almost unkillable. He's a very solid pickup right now, and he's going to be doing great, assuming that Riot doesn't touch him anymore. But you want to know who did get touched on this patch? Trindamir. That's why he has moved up into A tier, and he's going to be our A tier highlight. Trindamir, alongside several other champions, got indirectly buffed in like seven ways across the past couple of patches. You add changes to zeal items, you add changes to ghost, you have the new unflinching, and this is just stacking up and stacking up and stacking up, and now it's reached a breaking point. Trinomir has access to more tenacity, he has access to more movement speed, he has more access to slow resist, he has more access to items that he would like to buy that give him things like slow resist or offensive stats. But there is still one caveat to playing Trinomir, and that's if you can get punished really hard in the early game, then you just simply shouldn't pick him. I mean, really, it's obvious, but I feel like I have to say it just to make sure that you don't forget. If you're fighting something like a Quint, or a Singed, or I don't know, even a Malphite. Don't pick Trindamir. Why are you trying to subject yourself to a lane that you're just going to lose anyways? Unless you have excellent wave control and mechanics, you're not gonna be able to do anything against the Malphite. You're not gonna get any snowball, you're often gonna get poked out of lane, and you're just gonna have a really hard time. Same thing would go for Quinn. You can never dive on top of her, she has access to blind, she can harass you over and over again in the early game, and if you ever mess up your wave, you're just doomed. You get zoned from experience and gold, or you die. Trinmir is very strong, you just have to pick him at the right times. And that's actually just a rule that you should apply to any champion in League, really. Another perfect example of this would be our B tier highlight, who is Poppy. If the enemy team has zero dashes that Poppy can stop and ground them with and prevent them from using further mobility with, you have no reason to pick her. Yeah, of course, Poppy has great damage. She has a really awesome CC in her R. She has a really unique E that is very powerful. And of course, her W is too. But if you have nothing to do with your W, then it just becomes a basically useless ability. This hurts Poppy in the late game a lot and also in the mid game where she might be showing up to team fights. If your only option to CC the enemy is to use your R or your E, then it's gonna be a pretty big waste. Moving on to C tier, let's talk about Lucian as he's a champion who's actually been kind of struggling lately. He moved downwards actually. It seems like, despite his buffs, it didn't actually really net him anything, and with many other champions experiencing things that benefit them directly, whether it be health, items being buffed, summoner spells, runes, whatever, the change for Lucian, which really only affects him in the mid and late game, isn't really getting him anything in the early game, which is what he needs in order to take over the game in top lane. This just means that he's getting more L's than dubs right now, so it's really rough for him. But the champion who is really suffering is Yasuo, as he got nerfs that really hurt him in the top lane. Affecting a champion's durability will greatly affect their performance in top lane because it's such a long lane that is often drawn out. Yasuo also doesn't really get the chance to take advantage of his extra shielding now because frankly, he just doesn't get to do it as much. There aren't as many skill shots in the top lane, that's just a fact, and beyond that, it's also very risky for him to step up to other melee laners. 
be very careful when you pick Yasuo in the top lane, and you might just want to stick to having him as a counter pick for certain champions. Counter picking is pretty important in the top lane, as like I said, it's a very long and drawn out lane. Being able to work around your counter picks and salvaging the lane as best as you can, especially if you're a champion who scales, is a very important skill. And I mean, even before that, just drafting properly and understanding the champion before you pick them in every matchup that you can play them in is really important in League. To find guys that can really give you that juicy info, the really nitty gritty specific stuff that you need to improve in League, make sure you go check out our website GameLeap.com. We have tons of guides that are all made by challenger level players, people who are one tricks on their champions or know the champions really well because they played a lot of games on them. Or hey, maybe you're not looking for champion stuff, you're looking for lane specific tips that are just generic to the mid lane or the jungle, we got videos on that too. Or maybe you're looking for that info nutrient rich good stuff, the VOD reviews on pro players, challenger players, and other players in Grandmaster and Master who are really good at the champions that they play. All of that and more is what we can give you up there, so make sure you go check us out. But now that you know a little bit more about counter picking in the top lane, it's time to move on to the bush boys and talk about the jungle. And hey guys, guess what? I'll let you guess. I'm gonna let you guess right now. You got like three seconds. One, two, time's up, over. Volibear is broken tier, like I said. Some of you guys didn't want to believe me. You're like, oh dude, Volibear's trash. He's absolute garbage. He's not worth picking up. There's no way he'd be broken tier, but hey, look at that. One patch later, the man is the leader of the pack in the jungle right now. And yeah, by the way, I do read a lot of the comments that you guys put out for at least a few days after videos are released. And honestly, if you bring some flame about me and my ideas, you better get ready to get burnt back because I'm not just going to back down unless you guys give me some real legitimate arguments here. <clears throat> Looking at you people who are saying Kaisa is anything but D tier, uh huh. But that's for later. It's time to get back to the jungle. We've already gone over Volibear. He's broken tier. Y'all already know how that's working out. But let's talk about the S tier and talk about Zach. Zach is a jungler who, when he gets going, feels like he's everywhere at the same time. He's got a slingshot ability that can get him into any lane from almost any angle, and because of that, his pressure and his ganks and the ability to impact the map is really, really high. But Zach's one weakness is that he can't really do objectives on his own. So if the ganks start failing, if he isn't finding opportunities, he's not going to have a good time in the long run. Zach is very, very strong, but just make sure that you watch out for that one weakness. In A tier, let's talk about Xin Zhao. He's an interesting champ who hasn't really had anything in a spotlight for quite some time now, but he's kind of coming back up and it does make sense. Right now, a lot of the junglers are very weak in the early game, and while there are some junglers who are still strong in the early game, such as Graves or even Lee Sin, there are others who are extremely weak, Zack being one of them, Fiddlesticks being another, Kane yet another. And with these junglers being there, Xin Zhao does have a place because he can invade, play very aggressively, and also be ganking lanes. And he, as a jungler, can fall back on soloing objectives because he does have the power to do so. Many times, this allows Xin Zhao to have a decent place in most games. Just do realize that most of the time, you will be getting outscaled unless you are extremely far ahead. But now let's hop into the B tier. And here, we can highlight really any champion, but for now, let's talk about Elise. The shift in the jungle meta has made champions who focus solely on bursting out specific champions a lot weaker, and this is also even worse because of the bot lane meta right now. Champions who only have burst and can't do anything else are struggling. As an Elise, it can be really hard to kill somebody like Zac before they can do something, or Warwick or Volibear, and I can throw in any other name here and you'd get the idea. Same thing in the bottom lane when they're getting ganks and stuff if they're trying to kill that Ash, right? The enemy Karma and the Ash having heal plus the Karma having exhaust, it's very hard to get anything done. With champions like Elise who only have that option and they need to have a lead in order to do that option in the first place, it could feel really, really hard to even get going in a game. She and others are just barely hanging on at B tier, but that might change in the next patch or even over the course of this one. There's still quite a few days left and her performance might continue to deteriorate. Now we can move into the C tier though, and we're going to highlight Pantheon here as he recently moved downwards quite a bit. Pantheon is in the same bus where he struggles because his main thing that he does is burst people out. And while he does have some flexibility in his E to soak a lot of damage, it could be really hard to do so when there's a lot of CC in the game right now. It can be extremely hard on Pantheon to win games even when you're incredibly far ahead unless you're playing pretty much perfectly. And when you need the stars to align like that, it's a bit much of an ask and it's why he's doing so bad right now. Lastly in the D tier, I will pose the same question that I did last time. Riot Games, why are you buffing a champion in the jungle if you don't actually intend on making them a good jungler? I will keep Yorick and the other champions who they decided to give some random jungle buffs here and there, who are normally laners, on the jungle list until they actually manage to come up with an answer to that question. All the champions that they did these to either really really suck in the jungle, or just aren't played enough for there to be enough good statistics. And honestly, Yorick is one of the ones who is just kinda both. 
With the shakedown of the Bush Boys being complete, now we can head bot lane and talk about 80 carries. This is probably the tier list that saw the second most changes, as jungle definitely was the first. The meta shifted really hard there, so that's not very surprising, but bot lane hasn't changed too much, but there has been quite a few shifts around. First of all, in broken tier, we got Kog'Maw, and before, he was in there with Yasuo, but Yasuo's actually moved down, and this is because of the nerfs that he received. Yasuo being much more fragile has impacted his performance quite a bit. Not quite enough to take him down all the way to A tier or even lower, but it's still pretty convincingly worse. Right now, the only real thing holding Kog'Ma at the top is really the fact that none of the other AD carries have gotten buffed in a meaningful way. If anybody even got a small buff, I wouldn't be surprised if they did way better than Kog'Maw is right now. The main thing here is that the meta really suits Kog'Maw, and a champion like Kog'Maw, who has really good range, a ton of damage, and very high attack speed, is very much suited to the support meta that we've been seeing. So not only is he individually one of the AD carries who hasn't really been nerfed, but he's also just good in general with many team comps and champions who are also popular right now. That being said, that's pretty much enough about him. Let's talk about S tier and highlight Ezreal here, as Ezreal has jumped up two full tiers. Really, this drastic change in performance for Ezreal comes from people realizing just how broken of an item Death Stance actually is. I would not be surprised to see many, many AD carries start to have way better games now because people are just trying to build Death Stance on them and finding out that it's actually insanely shattered. I said this quite a while ago, but it seemed to kind of creep away slowly, but now it's coming up, it's coming up, and people are suddenly realizing like, wow, this item doesn't actually make any sense. It can turn Aphelios, Ezreal, Ash, and plenty of other champions into basically bruisers in terms of their durability, while still dishing out 80 carry levels of damage. The main thing that was holding Ezreal back is that if you made one mistake, you were almost always dead. But now, he has the ability to survive a lot of the times, even if he makes a mistake. Death Stance is also very particularly good for him because he can get a really, really nice 40% CDR curve with a really solid build without having to take sorcery, so he can take other options that make him stronger in lane or scale harder. Now, for our A tier highlight, you might have already guessed since I mentioned him already, but we're going to highlight Aphelios. He is having the same effect that Ezreal is right now. Not only is he pretty strong, but he's also very difficult and usually can't afford to make mistakes. Death Stance allows him to make mistakes. It also just completely nullifies the ability of certain champions to kill Aphelios. Aphelios is already hard to kill if he has Severin Pistol, and even if he doesn't, he's still pretty convincingly hard to kill. You always have the option of rooting people with Gravitum, slowing them with the normal auto attacks, outranging them with your sniper rifle, bursting them with Infernum, using the Chakrams to set down towers, like you got a lot there on that champion. Now, all of that is still there, and it's also better. For B tier, let's talk about Varus very briefly, as he did get a relatively small nerf on the patch. This nerf was a nerf to his scaling AD, which was really tiny, and a nerf to his Q ratio. The thing is, is that Varus losing that amount of damage on his Q doesn't change what Varus does super well. It's not very hard to hit people with super long range skill shots from the Fog of War. And if it's doing 100 less damage, it doesn't matter if you can just repeatedly hit them over and over again. The nerfs hit Varus' one-shot potential, but that's not why you pick Varus, it's not what you're trying to do. If you're insanely fed because you happen to find a ton of kills, then sure, yeah, it's gonna happen. But really, you're not gonna find much of a difference in how Varus plays right now from those nerfs, and that's why he hasn't moved anywhere and is still pretty middle of the pack. For C tier, I'm gonna highlight Zaya because she's more of a traditional AD carry than Heimerdinger is, just so it makes a little bit more sense. The main appeal of Zaya is being able to kite backwards and then hit a bunch of people with a high damage burst from your feathers. However, in this meta, her bursting people doesn't really matter if the people on top of her have 4000 health. Zaya is also very weak to long range skill shots and poke, as well as champions who can dive repeatedly without being at super high risk. If you rewind a little bit and take a look at her top and jungle tier list, as well as the mid, you're probably going to notice why she's not doing super well. She could be doing better if the meta favored her, but if the meta favored her and she got even just a tiny buff, then she would be very strong. And lastly in D tier, I mentioned it earlier, but we're gonna highlight Kai'Sa, because guys, why would you think Kai'Sa would be anywhere else? And you know what, actually, let's highlight Lucian at the same time, why not? Let's do a double feature, let's do it. Kai'Sa and Lucian are two champions who have two very similar play styles in the sense that they have something they want to accomplish. They both want to dodge out on enemies damage, either using the E or the R depending on who you're playing, and using their abilities to just outvalue their opponent, either by doing a bunch of auto attack cancels with their abilities or whatever else. But now we have the precedent set that they are mechanically difficult to play and also pretty hard to learn. Beyond that, because of the support meta, a lot of their rhythms that they like to be in gets disrupted a lot. 
And really, if a support plays well, it can almost be impossible for these champions to do what they want to do and get a lead in the early game. While Lucian is more on that end, Kai'Sa could definitely use one, as if she gets one, it is extremely helpful to her, since stats to her matter so much. Really, it's just too hard for these champions to get into fights and actually do what they want to do. Even with the lead, it can still be difficult, because the enemy team will just have such an easier time executing what they need to do in order to win. That's basically the entire problem with these 280 carries. You want to get up close, you want to get value by dodging things, you want to do a bunch of burst or maybe even some DPS, but you can't do any of that because you're forced to sit still, you're being outranged, you can't get around the terrain that the enemy is messing with, there's too much CC coming your way, and the problems keep going until I can no longer breathe and run out of air in the sentence. But with that clarification now, we've finished the 80 carries, so it's time to move on to the support tier list and wrap everything up. For Broken Tier on support, things have been ping-ponging back and forth between Janna and Tarek, and they keep bouncing between S and Broken Tier, swapping places with each other over and over again. This week, it's gonna be Janna. The two champions have this very interesting relationship, and so I'll actually also highlight Tarek in the S tier here and talk about them both. The lower elo you are, the better Tarek becomes, and the higher elo you are, the better Janna becomes. And now, I'm no scientist, but I can have a pretty good idea as to why that is. You see, Janna's a lot simpler to play, and she also has less counterplay. Janna CC is knockups, which can't even be QSS unless you have some other mobility spell on you. Janna's healing is stronger in a shorter period of time and also costs less mana, but it's slightly harder to use, but it also has a bigger AoE, so you're gonna hit more people. But when you compare that to Tarek's ultimate, in terms of just not comparing it to what their healing abilities are, Tarek's ultimate is way harder to use properly and can super easily be wasted. The highlights and drawbacks really end up painting a picture where Janna is just doing a bit better than Tarek in higher elos, and Tarek is doing a bit better than Janna at lower ones. Overall, the balance seems to be in Janna's favor. Now that we wrapped up the duo spotlight, let's move on to the A tier and talk about Swain, who recently moved up. Swain is a champion who can punish enchanters like Janna, Lulu, Sona, and others because of his very powerful CC and very, very high damage. He can also completely nullify engages from those supports and even just outvalue their healing or utility that they bring to their own team. Being so strong against immobile champions as well as champions who are squishy, Swain's having a great time right now. Right now, he's just in a position where it's extremely low risk for him to play, and so he's only really finding success. Going into the B tier, let's talk about Pike. Pike's moved down here, and that's because of the shift in the support meta, really. There's a lot more healing available to people, and also a lot more health on people. Items like Death Stance and Enchanters being played across the map, like Soraka, or even just being played at all, has the enemy team being a lot more healthy and harder to kill, and harder to get in execute range. This doesn't matter as much for Pike mid, because Pike mid has a lot more damage than Pike support, that's why he's so much weaker here. For T tier, let's highlight Braum, as he moved downwards from B tier actually, and honestly that's pretty hard to do. Strangely enough, this is also happening when Guardian, one of the main runes that Braum likes to take, got buffed. Overall, he's doing slightly better than what he was before, but compared to the rest of the champions, it just isn't measuring up. The loss of the movement speed in Guardian may very well be having an impact on Braum, even though the shield is bigger, and perhaps that's why he's not doing as well as his other counterparts who are using it, when some of them are ranged or have a way to get around. Lastly in D tier, Tom Kench is there all by his lonesome, and that's because 1. Nobody really plays him, and 2. When he's played, he's extremely underwhelming. And that's because Tom Kench is one of those champions that Riot Games is like, oh well okay, we're just gonna balance him around pro play and nothing else because that's all that makes sense, goodbye. Kinda a lame approach, but you could argue that it's a necessary evil. But with that, that is all of our tier lists for patch 10.12. And to find more guides that aren't just a tier list like this and actually teach you active skills in order to be better at League of Legends, you should go check out our website, GameLeap.com. Now you might have seen that we've been releasing quite a few more champion guides on the channel, and that's no coincidence. We've kind of moved to releasing some of the more champion related content here on YouTube, but we also have way more and way more in-depth guides on our website. And all of these guides are done by challenger level players, and it's not like they're just on champions either. We have guides on macro skills that pertain to how you move around the map, how you play with minion waves, and how you play around objectives. 
Feeling like you're basically a pro there? Well, sure, go ahead. Check out our champion guides instead and get more mechanically proficient at who you're trying to play. No matter what you're looking for, there's something up there for you. So seriously, go check it out to get better and win your games. And if you made it this far, thanks for watching the whole video. What do you guys think? Do you disagree with anything in particular? I think I actually nailed this one pretty on the head. But if you do think I missed something or messed something up, please let me know in the comments. And anyways, as always, my name is Ace Windstorm, and I will see you all later.